Today it's our privilege to begin our study in the book of Deuteronomy. It's an incredible book. It is the last book that Moses had the privilege of pinning down for our Lord. And along with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and this book of Deuteronomy, those five books became the, let's call it the driver's training laws for the Jewish nation. Now all of us who know how to drive, some of us took a driver's training more than 40 years ago. I know I did more than 40 years ago. And yet the rules of the road have not changed that much. And so stop still means stop, go still means go, red means stop, yellow means caution. You know, we know the rules of the road. We may not know the laws of our land, but we know the rules of the road. Well, so it is with the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These books form the, the major laws that the Jewish people were to live by and to understand. It did not mean that they liked it, but it did mean that they, under, they did understand it. So when we pick up our Bible, in fact, I am here on the Deuteronomy page, when we look at Deuteronomy and we look at the rest of the entire Bible, I'm telling you folks, it is impossible to understand fully what the rest of the Bible is teaching us and telling us unless we know what the Jews thought about it. And the way we know what the Jews thought about it was by knowing uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Well, fortunately, uh, we have completed the work and study on Exodus and Genesis and Numbers. And I have not done Leviticus yet, but it is coming next. I decided to do Deuteronomy because it is a repetition of the laws in a real compact way. And it is a good summary for us to know, all of us to know, before we actually get into the nitty gritty of the book of Leviticus. Well, this book of Deuteronomy that we study, the original Jewish name for this book comes from the very first two Hebrew words that are found in the very first sentence. Those two words are Ele Hadab Harem, which are translated into English as these are the words. So if you were a Jewish person, you're picking up a Bible, a Jewish Bible, a Tanakh, and you're reading what the title is, basically the title is going to say, these are the words. Now the name Deuteronomy that we come to use and we have come to use actually come to, comes to us from the Greek Septuagint. And when the Greeks in 250 BC translated the old Hebrew text into Greek for all the Greek speaking Jews, that translation was called by them the book of Deuteronomion. Deuteronomion which can be translated into English as the second law, the second law. Now, therefore, it is often said by many books and many commentators and many pastors that this book is a restatement of the laws that are already found in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And although the laws were given to Moses by the Lord after the completion of the history that is found in the book of Genesis. After a thorough study of the, all five books, it is clear that the Lord held to the law that he gave to Moses in how he dealt with all of mankind from the time of creation of Adam until the time of the death of Joseph in the book of Genesis. And what I'm just saying to you is, in the book of Genesis and during the time of Genesis, there was no law for the people. They did as they pleased. They did as they saw fit from the creation of Adam till the death of Joseph in the book of Genesis. But at the same time, uh, when Moses comes along and the Lord begins to dictate to him the events of, that are recorded in the book of Genesis, we find that he held to these same laws even when he had not put them in place yet. They were not in place yet. The people did not know them. 
but he held to them anyway. And here's an example. When the Lord called for all the animals to come and fill the ark that was built by Noah, there were a specific number of clean animals and a specific number of unclean animals who arrived. There were two pair of unclean animals and there were seven pair of unclean animals, male and female pairs that arrived to go on the boat, clean and unclean. Yet the law of the clean and the unclean animals was not even given to the world until it was dictated to Moses at the tent of meeting in the last months of the very first year that they were out of, of, the, uh, out of Egypt in the Exodus. Hundreds of years after the flood, still the Lord held to what was going, what he considered to be clean and unclean. Now the actual part of this book that contains the words that Moses recorded on the scroll and delivered in an oral message. It was written down on a scroll and then he delivered it. He read it to the nation of Israel. He did that on his 120th birthday. When we look at this, we can divide it into three sections. Moses wrote it in three sections. First of all, Moses revisited the main events in the 40-year history that had taken place since he showed up in Egypt, got them out of there, got to the Mount Sinai, got over to Kadesh Barnea, sent out the spies, all that got messed up. They had to go back to Mount Sinai for 38 more years after a year basically being on the road, 38 more years at Mount Sinai, 40 years is up, they take the journey out, they land at a place on a plain just on the other side of the Jordan River, and it has been 40 years, <clears throat> and Moses tells us a brief summary of that, of that history. That is found in chapters 1 through chapter 4. Second, Moses then revisits the laws. The laws that were dictated by the Lord to Moses while he was on Mount Sinai or while he was down at the tent of meeting once the Lord had left Mount Sinai and took his place there in that tent, we call it a tabernacle also, that the Lord had instructed them to build. And when it was built and the Ark of the Covenant was built and the mercy seat was sitting on top of the Ark behind the veil, the Lord left Mount Sinai and took residence hovering as the Shekinah glory of the Lord over the Ark of the Covenant on top of the mercy seat. So the Lord tells us all the laws that were either given to Moses up on Mount Sinai, such as the Ten Commandments, but also he tells us all the laws he gave in Leviticus when he wrote that down there in the tent of meeting in that last couple of months before they would take their first journey to go to Kadesh to mess up to have to come back for 38 years. That is in chapters 5 through 26. Third, Moses delivers a profound application based on a faithful adherence to the law which he imposes on the nation of Israel. And what is that application? He will give them and tell them that if they seek blessings in total obedience to the law of the Lord, they'll get it. He also implores them to understand that, that there will be a curse on them if they rebel against the law of the Lord. So they have to be ready in this application to accept the blessings of being obedient or understand that they're going to have to accept the curses for their disobedience if they do not adhere to the laws. Now once Moses delivers his three-part message, it's interesting at the end of the book, uh, on down through the book, it tells us that the, Moses took the scroll, rolled it back up, and he handed it to the Levites and he instructed the Levites to place that scroll inside of the Ark of the Covenant so it would always be there for them to always remember in that Ark, in the Covenant there. Well, after delivering the scroll to the Levites, it's out of his hands. He's no longer writing. 
Moses sang a song in front of the people. And then he spoke a word of blessing on each of the tribes. The song and the blessing were recorded by someone and added to the text in the scroll. Now on that day, the text in the Bible tells us that Moses was 120 years old. It was his 120th birthday. He was instructed by the Lord after he completed reading the scroll of Deuteronomy and handing it to the Levites and he sang his song, he gave the blessings and the Lord says, it's your 120th birthday, I want you to climb Mount Nebo and there Moses did and he died. The record of his death and his burial is also found in the book of the scroll, the Deuteronomy scroll. Moses is dead. How does he write it? He does not write it. Someone else writes it. I want to tell you folks, the name of Moses will not be forgotten after his death through the rest of the ages. It will not be forgotten. It will not be forgotten in the Old Testament. It will not be forgotten in the New Testament scriptures at all. In fact, it's not forgotten today. Many, many, many adhere to the laws of Moses today across many cultures and even many religions. All scripture from the front to the back relies on the Mosaic law that the Lord gave to Moses, Mount Sinai or at the tent of meeting, if you want to understand it and understand it in the way that the Jews understood it. Moses, the Lord's faithful servant. What an example for us all. As we study this book, it is my prayer that we can grasp its importance for our lives. And I think we can. With that, I want us to open up our Bibles to the very first chapter of Deuteronomy. As we begin here our study in this book of Deuteronomy with the nation of Israel in the final campsite with Moses. Moses will not be with them after this day that this book is read. He will no longer be there. In fact, we end up in the beginning of this book in the campsite exactly where we ended up the book of Numbers. Well, the book of Numbers ended in this very place, nestled in what is called the plain of Moab, next to the Jordan River, in the Arbar, across the river from Jericho. Now I want you to look at our map here. I've got a map here on the board that I want us to look at, and I'm going to show that to you. Let me get a pen here. They are nestled right here in the land of Moab, but on this side of these mountains, now you see here, this is the Sea of Galilee. This is the crooked, 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 really crooked Jordan River that goes all the way down to the eastern finger, the Sea of Aqaba of the Red Sea. Right here is a little jut on this side of the mountain range. And this right there is an area where they have landed that is called the Plain of Moab. It is the furthest northwestern corner of the land of Moab. And just up the mountain is a place that is called Nebo, and that is Mount Nebo, and that is where the Lord is going to send Moses, where he is going to die. Now, you notice here that Sea of Galilee comes all the way down. Here is Mount Sinai down here. Part of Mount Sinai, there's a place called Horeb. We're going to hear that name also in a little bit. That is part of Mount Sinai. This is the mountains of Eden. Here's Mount Seir over on this side. Here's Hebron. Now I want to show you something. This is interesting. Uh, it is very interesting. This plain that we see here in this little, I've squared it, but it's really not quite a square. That is not a small site. And in fact, if you can see, I'll put this other uh, picture on the screen there, you can see it. From the Jordan River over to the mountains is about 15 miles across. And from the Dead Sea going north 
it is about 18 miles going north. Now you notice that there's the Dead Sea there. As we come back to my picture here on the board, you'll notice that there is no Dead Sea. And that is very interesting. You see, I haven't got a Dead Sea there. In fact, I want to take you back before the days of Moses, way before the days of Moses. Uh, the, the angel of the Lord and two of his other angels came and visited Abram and Sarah. And if you remember the story where the Lord tells Abram that he is going to have a child in the next year, tells Sarah, Here, here's it, she laughs. But there was another message that was going on down at the same time in that same visit. Moses had just had a, a rational conversation with the Lord where he says, listen, listen, if there's just 50 men in Sodom who are righteous, will you still destroy it? And you know that story where he finally gets down to 10. Because what had happened was right here on Mount Hebron, Abram had stood with his nephew Lot. And see that what had happened was, was the two tribes, the two people had gotten so large. Well, Abraham came out of came into the promised land with over 300 uh, male servants who could wield a sword. This was not a small group with just Abraham and Sarah that come, comes down. He's got, he's got warriors with him to protect him and their wives and their children. He's got lots of mouths that he has to feed. He decided, and, and Lot's family also had grown so big with all of his servants, they stood right here and Abraham said, you choose either this way or that way. Pick what you want and I'll take what's left over. So Lot looked over into the Jordan River Valley, which was plush and green. Well, if he's here, why would he be looking back up into here? He's looking over to the, to the east and he sees this valley and it is just gorgeous. Well, after the angels leave Abram, as you know, uh, the angels go on down to Sodom and Gomorrah to rescue Lot. And that night, the angels destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and the explosion is so hard and so heavy that it forms and destroys actually four cities and forms the Dead Sea. The Jordan River then dumps into the Dead Sea and does not continue to flow all the way down to the Gulf of Abba. If there's a little trail that goes off, a trail, but it's just a trickle. Sodom and Gomorrah are underneath that. Okay, just at the bottom edge of this plain of Moab is the Dead Sea, as you see back in our picture that I'm putting back up for you on the board. That is where they are. And if you'll notice on that picture, off to the, uh, off to the west, you'll see Jericho. You'll also see Gilgal. We know exactly where Jer uh, uh, Jericho is. They're going to, when they cross the Jordan River, after Moses has died and they have buried him, Joshua is going to lead the, the people across that Jordan River, and they're going to go across to take the promised land. You'll also notice, I've got it circled on that map, there's, in the, in the red circle, there is Nebo. That's where Moses was allowed to go up, and from that high point on the mountains of the Arabah, on those mountains, he is able to see the complete promised land from the height of those mountains. All the way north, see a Galilee, almost to Mount Hermon, and all the way down, he's able to see the promised land, and the Lord, he dies there, and the Lord buries him. Well, back to our, our commentary on the text. After the nation has heard the content of this book, Joshua will be the new leader and the nation will cross over the Jordan River headed west to conquer the promised land. The book begins with the author describing the location of the camp. So in chapter 1, verse 1, it says this, These are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel across the Jordan River in the wilderness. In the Arabah, opposite Suf, between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hazaroth and Dizrahab. So we hear the authorship here. Right off the bat, it is very obvious 
that Moses did not write this introduction because someone else is announcing that what we are about to read is the words of Moses and the author is also telling us where they are when Moses gave the words. But it's not Moses writing it. So we have to ask the question, who wrote this introduction? More than likely it was Joshua who took Moses' place in the leadership after Moses' death. That's more than likely who it is, and that's one of our main traditions. Now, how can we come to this conclusion that it was Joshua? First of all, Joshua was commissioned to take Moses' place. Moses completed saying and writing the context of this book, and he then commanded the Levites to take, take it and to place it in the Ark of the Covenant. That's found in chapter 31 verses 23 through 26. Second, Moses then sang the song recorded in chapter 32. But Moses did not write it. He sang it and someone else wrote it down. Third, then the Lord instructed Moses to immediately climb Mount Nebo where the Lord allowed him to look at the promised land before he died on that mount. Chapter 32, verse 48 through 52. Fourth, before Moses climbed the mountain, he blessed the sons of Israel, and that is recorded in chapter 33. So who recorded Moses' words and actions after he had completed his text and handed it over to the Levite to put it in the ark? It could have been Eleazar. That, he was the high priest. It could have been. Because he's the one who was going to receive the text and go put it in the ark because he could do that. He had taken his father, Aaron's place. Aaron was the high priest for the 40 years. And then, because of one of his sins, uh, he died. And he was buried on Mount Hor, uh, there down uh, after they were headed towards this plain of Moab. But, more than likely, it was Joshua who pinned down this text, Moses' successor. Now the people were accustomed to the law being delivered by its nation's leader, Moses. When Joshua became the nation's leader, I believe that he re his record, if he had t written it down, would also be accepted because he was ordained by God to be the successor after Moses. Also, Aaron, the high priest, did not write one letter of the law of Scripture, and neither did his son. Now, a clue to Joshua's possibility is found over in Joshua chapter 24, verse 26. And when we get over there and we read that, it says this, And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, that in other words, he wrote a book, but he also added some other stuff to the law. And this passage is in a reference to the book of Joshua, but he's also saying it's the law books. He wrote stuff in the law books. So that gives us a great point where we think that because Joshua was allowed to write in the book under his own name, Joshua, it can be reasonable that the Lord allowed him to complete the story in the book of Deuteronomy as well as place the introduction to Moses' words at the beginning of Deuteronomy chapter 1. So we come to the location now. First we read that they were camped where? Across the Jordan in the wilderness in the Arabah. Now this means the camp is on the east side of the Jordan River in the Arabah Valley. The word Arabah means barren area. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have grass and trees and be fruitful. It means no one is living there. It's un un unoccupied by humans. And it's a valley that, by the way, runs all the way from just south of Mount Hermon all the way down through the Sea of Galilee, all the way down through the Dead Sea, and all the way down to the Sea of Aqaba, uh, which is, the, is this eastern finger of the Red Sea. 
The valley is about 15 miles wide at its widest point, its width, but the valley from both sides of the Jordan River is about 15 miles wide, and it is running down, that Jordan River runs right down through that valley. Now prior to that destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Dead Sea did not exist, and I told you about that just a little while ago. But after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, found in Genesis chapter 18 through 21, this place becomes the lowest place on earth. The lowest place on earth. Now, even with the formation of the Dead Sea, which stopped the flow of the Jordan River, the Arabah continued all the way down to the Sea of Aqaba, just like it if the, if the Jordan River would have been there even though there's very little flow in this last 100 miles. We must be careful when we're studying in about the Arabah because many of the modern uses, it refers only to this bottom 100 miles. However, in the old maps and all that, it is this area on either side of the Jordan River and where it's not now, either side of these mountain ranges. And you see, here's a mountain range here, here's a mountain range here. This little trough is absolutely, uh, bound, has boundaries on either side by these mountains and it's sitting in a valley. We call it the Jordan River Valley. We call it the Arabah Valley. It's, it is a valley. And in some of the places here in this valley, it is the lowest place on earth, especially this sea of Dead Sea is 1,420 feet lower than the Mediterranean Sea, which is right here. And so with that, modern descriptions of this valley would lead us to conclude that the camp of Israel is way down here, not across from Jericho, but way down here in the bottom. But that is wrong. That is absolutely wrong. Jordan, this, this camp set opposite of Jericho, which is right here on the map. The campers located in the Arba in this northern portion of the land of Moab. Now, a look at a relief map of the country and surroundings of Israel is especially helpful. And I have a relief map here. I wish I had a bigger uh, picture of it or a bigger size of it, but I love this. I'm taking pictures and I'm going to show you some a little bit closer. Now you say, what is a relief map? Well, a relief map is to scale. Everything here is to scale, even the mountains. And there's a mountain range here on this side of the Jordan River, no, the Arba, and there's a mountain range on this side of the Arba. And it tells us here in the scale that one inch equals 20 miles. Now, folks, my finger is three quarters of an inch, which means my finger is 15 miles wide. And it's so interesting because this is to scale. I can put my finger there. It fits between the mountains. And every time I pull it down, as I pull it down through this valley, this trough that goes all the way down to the Red Sea, I've got working room on either side almost all the way down. This is low, very low. And it is the washout that has happened that is here where that Jordan River Valley runs. And it shows the terrain. If I could turn it or whatever, I don't know if I can show you, but these, if you can take and you can actually tape your, take your ruler and you can measure how high the mountains are uh, in feet by the, how tall it is as you measure across these mountains. That's what a relief map does. This is so very interesting. On that map, it is so easy to see that valley running all the way from the Sea of Galilee all the way down to that eastern finger of the Red Sea. And so we can also see that mountain runs on each, that mountains are, are on each side of this Arbol that's causing this valley. You can't have a valley without hills and mountains. So one of the things that's interesting is on a relief map, the relief map uses colors to show the le level. The whiter it is, 
the lower it is, the darker it is, the higher it is. And so here we see, I mean this Dead Sea is 1420 feet below the average sea level, which is over here in the Mediterranean Sea. So it's very clear what is going on. But on this relief map we can also see this location for the plain of Moab. And in fact this is a modern map and lo and behold they have right here just in that place I showed you a while ago of the Dead Sea they have it says the plain of Moab. Its eastern border is a high mountain range that begins far to the north in Mount Hermon and comes all the way, that's the Arba. In fact it runs all the way down through the sea, the Red Sea and these mountains that run all the way from Mount Hermon all the way down then come on down like you see on my map here on the board starts at Mount Hermon, they actually go a little further than that they come all the way down, they come on this side past Mount Sinai and they go all the way to the Indian Ocean. That's those mountains that are on the same side as the land of Moab. So the plain of Moab sits east of the Jordan River and it's about 15 miles wide from east to west and about 18 miles tall from north to south. And although it looks small on our map, it is not small. I always like to do show and tell, so let me show you how the size of this plain. This plain is big. In fact, if you live in Houston, we have a loop that goes around downtown Houston called Loop 610. Loop 610 is 38 miles long all the way around and that loop sits, 610, will sit nicely inside of the area that is called the Plain of Moab. Let me show you a map. Here we're back to that same map again. Remember you see from the Jordan River over to the mountains there, on the east side uh, where that uh, big uh, kind of red dot is, that's 15 miles across and 18 miles going from uh, south to north. <clears throat> now I want to show you another map. This is a map of 16 loop around Houston. Everything inside the 610 loop is considered inner Houston. Now down on the very south where it says south, that's Highway 45. And there is a mile marker there from Galveston that says right at Gulf Gate, right where Highway 45 meets uh, 610, that mile marker is mile marker 40. Go to where it says north on that map. That is where I-45 meets the north loop 610. There the mile marker says 51. Well, 51 minus 40 is 11. It is 11 miles from north to south on that, uh, uh, across our Loop 610. Now from east to west, right there on the west where you see that, there is a mile marker where, where I-10 meets 610. First Baptist Church, by the way, of Houston is right in that corner. There the mile marker is 762, 762. You follow I-10 all the way across to where it crosses on the east side going up over the Hartman Bridge and over there over the ship channel, that area. That mile marker is 774. 774 minus 762 is 12 miles. So everything inside, downtown Houston, all the wards, everything inside of Loop 610 is 12 miles across and about 11 miles of up and down from north to south. Let's take this map now. You see we're back with our map. You've got a little square there because that's about the size that I have figured out that we need of space to hold the nation of Israel. And it, by the way, when they camped, they had to camp in a specific way. In fact, headed over towards Nebo, where that area goes towards Nebo or out towards the east, Judah would have always been camped on that outside edge facing the sun. And then the other tribes had their specific place with the, with the ark and the, and the Levites and everything right in the middle. 
no matter where they camped, they had to camp in the same way. So you couldn't be a little kid that got lost from the tribe of Judah. You knew exactly which way to head in order to find your way home. Same thing for Ephraim. You're going to head back to the other end because Ephraim was to be a protected nation, a protected group of the, of the Jewish people. And it's back on the other side, on the west side. Okay, back to our map here. We see our map and there's that square. Now I'm going to superimpose onto this map the 610 loop to scale. And there we have it. You see, that 610 loop will sit nicely, nicely inside of that area that we call the plain of Moab. The plain is more than adequate to keep the camp of, ne of the nation of Israel with all of its cattle, with all of its, 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 its flocks, it's big enough. Plus, it's fertile ground. <clears throat> in fact, it's some of the most fertile ground in Moab. A satellite map of the area today will show you plot after plot after plot of acres after acres after acres after acres of green fields of food for harvest. Look at this map. This is a map today, and you'll see that the mountains are going around the edge there. This is right in that corner where the mountains kind of form a triangle. Look at all of those plots. Those are more than an acre big, each of them. There is lots of green area as they get closer. It's a fertile place. It was big enough to provide for uh, uh, the nation of Israel to be there. So the passage also says that the camp was opposite Suf, between Paran and Tophil and Laban and Hazeroth and Dizrahab. Now, you have to remember, we are translating from Hebrew into English. And things sometimes get turned around in how we understand in the English. I want us to focus on something here. You see that word opposite? It is a key to understanding where the camp was located. The word opposite is the Hebrew word mal, and it means front, in front of, or it means to go forward. So any of these meanings, wherever it's found, always means something is in front of something else. In front of something. Uh, it's, when we think of opposite, it's this way or that way. This is in front of something. And in this case, the camp is in front or it is forward from a place called Suf. In other words, they were camped in the plain of Moab, but in order to get there, they had to go forward from somewhere else and they went forward from the place of Suf, which by the way in, is the Hebrew word that means read or read. And it is found in the Hebrew Scripture only in one place like this, and it is in this book of Deuteronomy. Now, some say that Suf means the Red Sea. But it cannot specifically be the case because every reference to the Red Sea has another word with it. The word Jam, Jam Suf, which Jam means the word for sea. Nevertheless, Suf means a location somewhere on the way to the campsite in the Arba, in the plain of Moab. It is some place where they had started from or by. Well, as for the location markers of places like Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hazeroth and Dizahab, some scholars take the position that these places were boundary places around the land of Moab. They take it up that these are boundaries for the land of, the boundary limits for the land of Moab. The problem is the village of, the, of Paran sits in the Arabah south of the Dead Sea. Right here is the village of Paran. We know exactly where it is because on this side of this dotted line is the wilderness of Paran and above it is the wilderness of Zin and we know that Kadesh Barnea sits right on the joining of the two wildernesses and that this is the city called Paran which was one of the main cities in the Edomite. It's not anywhere near the land of, of Moab. In fact, it's 60 miles south from the campsite there on the Arabah 
north of the Dead Sea. Paran is not part of Moab. Tophel and Laban are mentioned only here in this passage with no further indication as to their whereabouts. Although we do have the word Hazarath and it's mentioned over the book of Numbers, but this Ahab is not. None of the villages though were part of this land of Moab. We don't have any maps that say any of these are part of land, even though you've got commentaries that say they are. So these names cannot indicate some unknown localities in this land of Moab. It just, they just cannot. I think we've, with our Western minds, we've read into this something that is not there. However, also, Hebrew names have meaning, meanings. For instance, Tophel means a drum. Laban means white. Hazaroth means villages. Dizarhab means gold. But on the other hand, something much simpler, I believe, can be understood by these words. I think it's very simple. It means, uh, the scripture says, opposite Suf, between Paran, Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and Dizahab. Okay. Now perhaps this is the description of where the nation of Israel came from as they moved forward forward to this final camp there with Moses. They had to leave something. They had to go forward from Seth. And so what I'm telling you is, I am telling you that Seth probably does mean the Red Sea because this is the area of the Red Sea that they're coming. They're going to come over towards this and they're going to take the, the traditional highway trade route that's going to go north and south here to come up to cross over. So they're going to follow because that trade route runs on this west east side of this Jordan River and these mountains. It's a major trade route that is there. The last time that the camp was at Kadesh Barnea was for the death of Miriam a few months before this message. So before they headed east to cross the mountain where Aaron died and was buried before they turned north to go to stop at that final campsite, we can surmise something about this and verse 2 gives us the clue. It's the distance from Mount Sinai. It says, it is 11 days journey from Mount Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. He's not telling us how far that journey is every time they tried to take it. No. He's just telling us this time and this specific time, this is how far it was. This tells us the distance from Horeb, a location on Mount Sinai, to Kadesh Barnea, that it was 11 days journey. Horeb is a location on Mount Sinai. It took them 11 days to get to Kadesh Barnea. Took them 11 days to get there at Kadesh Barnea by way of coming by Mount Seir. Well, that's a very interesting thing. Now, it's often considered that a day's journey is about 20 miles at the most for an individual or a small group to travel on foot and with carts. But for a camp this size, for the size, camp the size of the nation of Israel, carrying everything they had, moving cattle, moving in masses, a day's journey could not have been 20 miles at a time. At 10, probably at the most. See, I want to tell you something. If this opening passage was intended to give a short synopsis of the journey from Mount Sinai, as I surmise that it is, it was written in reverse order. If we turn this thing around, we see that when we start with Suf and move backwards, here's what we get. We turn it around and we find that it took 11 days after they left Mount Sinai, which was east of Suf, east of the Red River, a Red Sea, not the Red River, we're not talking about Oklahoma, but we're talking east, which is a reference to the Red Sea, taking them by Mount Seir on the way to Kadesh Barnea, which was not the way that they had taken it the first place. That was an 11 days journey. To get there, they journeyed through many villages and watering sites as well as traversing Mount Seir, located on the mountain range in the tribal area of Edom. This is Edom's land down here. Edom, the descendants of Esau. 
and it's located on this mountain range here, and it's between Mount Sinai and Kadesh. It is 110 miles from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea, and it took 11 days. Well, you don't have to be, um, you don't have to be a scientist to understand 110 divided by 11 is 10 miles per day. Now, I know they're going to be taking these routes. There's, there's actually trade routes that come through this. They're following the trade routes. They're not off on their own going through barren land. Why would they want to do that? Because all the trade routes already went through the watering places where you could get water for your, and food and stuff like that, where you could, you could furnish everything you needed for the, for the man and for the beast. So why would they go a different direction? And so it's 10 miles per day. And they're carrying these loads. The carrying of the loads was a factor. However, the transfer of the holy objects, the Ark of the Covenant and the menorah and the Tent of Meeting was done in a very reverent way as they marched. They could not, the, the whole caravan could not move too fast and neither could it move too slow. These priests were carrying these objects on foot. Nothing was on carts. They were carrying it on their shoulders of the entire uh, part of the tabernacle and all of that. And they are headed and they cannot move. The people in the front cannot move any faster than the priest can move. And the people behind cannot move any faster than the priest can move. And they've got to move at a certain course so no one is overrun and no one is left behind. Now according to Numbers 33 verse 16, the first night's camp that was recorded on the journey coming out of Mount Sinai was a place called Kilbroth Hadavah. The name means Graves of the Desire. Now, as they leave Mount Sinai, they're going to go by Kilbroth Hadavah. We wish we knew where it was, but it's the first day. It's the first 10 miles out of Mount Sinai. And this is the place where the Israelites 38 years, really 30, almost 39 years before, had murmured against God. And we find that story in Numbers chapter 11, verse 34. It was a place where many died because they were murmuring against God. And so it's plausible that Dizahab, mentioned last in Deuteronomy 1.1, was the camp before or just after Kilbroth, but not before Hazaroth. Because Moses is reminding them in all these places of places where certain things happened. Numbers 33, chapter, the, the chapter 33, verse 17, takes the journey from Kilbroth to Hazaroth, where we got there. And although Hazaroth is but a blur, I've got a question mark up. We know it's on this road somewhere before they get to the land of Eden. Although it is a blur in its location, and it's not no known, there's an important story that happened there. Because that is the place, Hazaroth, that is the place where Miriam squabbled with Moses and the Lord gave Miriam leprosy. And the journey to Kadesh Barnea could not continue, could not continue until Miriam was healed. Miriam died, was diagnosed with this whiteness of this rotting skin. And so she was put outside the camp. I personally believe this place called Laban around it here after Hazaroth is the place where they put her outside the camp and they named it the place of the whiteness or the place of the leprosy. The camp, the rest of the camp was still in Hazaroth but a distance away in what they're going to call Labram or the white, white area was the place where Miriam was there in Deuteronomy 1.1. Laban is most likely the name of the, the place that the Israelite gave for Marion to wait through that leprosy. It was more likely just outside the camp. Now moving backward through the list in Deuteronomy 1.1, because remember I'm telling you we're doing it backwards, Tophel is next in the location mentioned by Moses. So we've come back with our place and Tophel we know is Toph right there. It's got another name now today. It's T... Um, on the map, it's T-U-F-I-L-E-H. And it's about 15 miles south of the Dead Sea on this east side of the Arba. 
And right by it is a perfect place to descend into the valley of Zered and make the cross where the path goes through there, the trade route, to head over towards Kadesh Barnea, to head this way towards Kadesh Barnea. You notice almost what's in the way? A little area called Paran. And Paran is next mentioned in the text. According to Numbers 10, verse 12 and 33, Paran was a three days journey from Mount Sinai for normal people. I mean, you could get there in a hurry. You could. You could zip up and you could do it and you could do it. No problem with that. Because remember, three days is 60 miles or so. Well, we can make this. We've still got a ways to go. It's 110 miles over here. My map's not to scale. So years before, Paran was the home place of Ishmael, and it was a place of res refuge. And so this place, this camp of Tophel, is a perfect place for them to camp before they start to head west, to head towards Paran and to Kadesh Barnea and the mountains of Paran that are there. So this campsite of Paran is on the western side of the Arabah, and it's right there on the edge of the wilderness of Paran, and they've got to go through the wilderness of Paran and get almost to the wilderness of Zin, and there, which is the border of Edom, by the way, the, the reason why they changed the name is because there's a border of who's controlling it, and we find Kadesh Barnea is right there, and that's the place that they're going to send out the 12 spies, or at least they did 38 years before. They sent out the 12 spies into the promised land. It is also the place where the great sin occurred on the part of the nation of Israel that caused the camp to be sent back to Sinai for 38 more years and the death of everyone 20 years of age except for Joshua and for Caleb. How many would die? Now, we don't know exactly how many people would die in that 38-year time. The census that was taken at the beginning of the book of Numbers, 38 years before, told us there were 603,550 men who were aged 20 or over and able to go to war. That's not including the women, it's not including the children, and it's not including any elderly, feeble men or women that were not counted just the men who were able to go out to war. Needless to say, at least 603,550 people died, males died, as a result of the sin that happened in Kadesh Barnea, and they were buried in the sands. And at the time Moses gives this account in Deuteronomy, 38 years have passed, and everyone over 20 has died. The new group that is there, that is headed to the promised land, is standing with Moses. And how many people are standing there? We don't know exactly. But Numbers 26 tells us that there were 601,730 who, men who were aged 20 or older and able to go to war, not including the men, not including the women and the children that were under, the children that were under the age of 20. But that means that standing there with Moses, excluding Moses and Joshua and Caleb, who are much older, no one in the camp in the plain of Moab is over 58 years old, excluding Moses, Joshua, and Caleb. Moses is 120, and he's about to die that day. Many were these people that are there, this of the people that are there, the men, women, and children, everything, the men, 601,730, were not even born 38 years before. So on the last journey for the nation of Israel, the camp revisits the place of its great sins 38 years before. All of these places, something happened that are mentioned here that were important in the life of the nation of Israel. Finally, they end up in Kadesh, and there Miriam dies, and she is buried there at Kadesh. And from there, the camp turns and heads back east, and they're going to head back towards the land of the Edomites, and they're going to cross near Paran. And they're going to camp at Mount Seir. That is a mountain range. That's this mountain range. It's called Mountain Seir. And this range, and the highest point on Mount Seir's range is a place called Mount Hor. It is on my relief map. Mount Hor on the, on the mountain range of Mount Seir. Aaron died there and he was buried. 
And there, from Mount Seir, the nation crosses over and comes back to that highway and goes straight up north, and they go through and they settle, on, they're on that trade route, and they settle in the plain of Moab. And finally, the camp is there in the Arabah, in the plain of Moab, where Moses was to give his last address to the people. Verse 3a says this. This is the year after the Exodus. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the children of Israel. This date tells us something. Moses began delivering the message that he had written down on the scroll 40 years in the first day of the 11th month. Now remember, it takes 12 months to finish the 40th year. So he is on the first day. He is a full two months ahead of finishing the 40th year when he's writing this. Back in Numbers chapter 20, we find that the nation of Israel left Mount Sinai for the very last time on the first month of the 40th year. In other words, they're now on the first month of the, the, the first day of the 11th month, which means it took them 10 full months to come from Mount Sinai up around over to Kadesh, wait and do all of that, go to Mount Seir, wait and do all of that with, with Aaron, come over up to the land of Moab, come and land here, and then they're going to fight these battles. We haven't even spoke about these battles yet. We're fixing to. And finally, it is time. The battle is over with the two Ammonite kings, and it's time for Moses to deliver this message to the people on day one of the 11th month. Now, what was the purpose of this book? The purpose of this book was to remind Israel of the commandments. Verse 3b, chapter 1, verse 3b says, according to all that the Lord had commanded him to give to them. The second person, purpose of this book was to remind Israel of the enemies they have faced. The scripture says there in verse 4, after he had defeated Sion, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Basham, who lived in Asheroth, and Indre, these were battles that were detailed back in Numbers chapter 21. And these are the battles. They are in the plain of Moab, and from the Amorite area north of Moab, these two Amorite kings are going to attack, and Moses has to defeat them. The third reason and third purpose for this book is to remind Israel of the law. Where would he remind them of the law? The text says in verse 5, Across the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to expound the law, saying, that is verse 5, And with that, whoever penned these first five verses, we think it was Joshua, that Joshua laid his pen down because what is left all the way down to chapter 30, verse 20, is what Moses would write. In addition, in chapter 31, verse 1, the narrative tells us that Moses delivered this message to the people on his birthday. That's in chapter 31, verse 1, on his birthday, his 120th birthday. And not only was it Moses' birthday, but it was also his resignation day because Joshua became the ruler of Israel on that day when he was commissioned that day. This also tells us that Moses was born on the first day of the 11th month of the Jewish year, 120 years before. He was born on the first day of the 11th month. And we will learn more about that and all of this as we move through this study of Deuteronomy. Now our time is up and we're going to end there. And we're going to pick up with chapter 1 verse 6 in our next time together. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the ability to have your word to read and to understand what you have done for us through the creation of this world, through the choosing of the nation of Israel, for the giving of the law that would lead to a Savior, would lead to you, Jesus. And I am so glad that you live in my heart 
And what a privilege it is to be a teacher of your word. In your name, amen and amen.